Good morning. Uh, I think from, you'll see from my presentation that uh, I'm not veterinary trained. It won't be quite as technical and be much shallower, but it is the insurance perspective. Some of the things that have been touched on already. So let me set the scene. In its 128 year history, Argo's mission has always been to immerse itself in the pet community. That's working with people in the pet community to influence the decisions of others in the pet community. A supportive relationship, for example, with breeders, animal rescue organisations, a relationship of trust with owners. Trust that when needed, that intangible insurance promise will be honoured. And of course, a close symbiotic relationship with the veterinary profession. Which is why I'm talking to you today. Vets are the service provider for the insurance industry. 98% of claims in volume and value are for veterinary fees. Vets are the key decision influencer when it comes to all things pet health. But increasingly in our brave new world, things transpire to challenge these relationships. We passionately believe in lifetime pet insurance. The cover vets would recognise as lifetime pet insurance. From research, lifetime policies meet owner expectations. Whatever policy an owner buys, from whichever brand, cheap or otherwise, and with whatever restrictions, they believe they're buying lifetime cover. A pool of money to pay for your veterinary fees that as long as you keep paying, the insurance policy will keep paying out. That means that something like 65% of owners potentially are going to be disappointed. With over 30% of our claims, settlements funding continuation treatment for chronic conditions, capping payouts, ongoing conditions for a period of time or a fixed amount will undoubtedly impact animal welfare and quality of life. In some cases, even an owner's decision to keep a chronically but manageably sick pet. And for vets, a lifetime policy means you can pull out all the stops and return a sick and injured animal back to health. And this is where it might get controversial for some of you. Pull out all the stops where appropriate. And it's the where appropriate that I believe is really beginning to challenge quality of life and animal welfare on two counts, which we'll talk about. And unless as industries we work much more closely together, it will force a much bigger third issue. So. We spent a lot of last year talking to vets. We hosted veterinary dinners. They culminated last year in January where we had 16 presidents around the table at the Kennel Club. Um, they were current, past, future, all from important animal, small animal uh, associations. There was no prescriptive agenda other to consider the challenges each sector faced with each other to share some potential initiatives, to note your feedback and debate the extent of cover and possible expansions or restrictions in cover in new emerging areas. We also spent a huge amount of time looking at the long-term sustainability of pet insurance and how we together endeavour to keep the current market offerings viable when we're set against threshold market prices where owners choose or are forced to self-insure. And when that point is reached, What's the prognosis of the veterinary sector? Flippantly, will the fiver and the biscuit tin suffice? For example, it's an estimated 75% plus incidence of insurance at secondary referral consultation. This sector would need to wholesale reinvent itself without insurance funding. So what are the drivers for the sustained pressure on claims cost, which in turn directly and proportionally drives premium inflation? The ABI, the Associated British Insurers data, which was released last week this year, show that since 2010, the average claim had increased by over 50%. Moreover, the claims frequency had increased much faster than that. For the insurance world, that's the perfect storm. Aside from the advances in veterinary science and defensive medicine in all its guises, the consensus around the table was that too much is being done to animals that just aren't that sick, which in itself is a huge welfare issue, as we heard from Sarah. Moreover, it was felt that between 50 and 60% of pets uh, presented would just get better with no intervention at all, which I thought was a pretty damning indictment of the profession by the profession. Can we believe that? I can believe that. 
we sit there when it snows and no claims come in. You know, we sit there bracing ourselves for the flood of claims at the, at the end of the, 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 the weather event. It just doesn't happen. Nothing happens. Minor symptoms are resolved. Owners have moved on. In a similar vein, when pushed at the veterinary dinners, uh, where there is intervention, for insured and uninsured, there's not a great deal of difference in the outcomes. However, there's a huge difference in the diagnostic and treatments and treatment protocols that those animals get. So there's a balance to be struck in terms of advice offered and treatment given. Sarah again mentioned euthanasia. Uh, it's at the other extreme of life, you know, the quality of life and the end of life debate. The pressures of owners demanding to keep their pets going at all costs, save my pet, and the insured owner with the funds to pay. Judging quality of life scenarios, decisions around the humane endpoint is anything but easy. Take decisions around the impact of comorbidities in older pets, debilitating chemotherapy regimes, severe osteoarthritis, long-term outcomes from advanced surgical procedures in both old and young patients, removing the commercial pressures on the attending vet uh, in a rapidly changing world, you know, the sense in some quarters that to end life is failure, and even worse, the fact that fringe of the profession that seems to have forgotten that euthanasia and the ability to end suffering is a privilege, and a privilege that uh, your human practitioner counterparts uh, just don't have. So what can pets conceptualize? Sitting in the pet shoes, do they experience fear? Of course they do. You would all have seen the bullish alpha male as he's dragged into your waiting room terrified. How about pain? Absolutely. Moreover, you know, with, the, with, the, with the animals that, uh, that you see on the small animal side, it's completely transparent. No motivation or driver to hide or disguise that fact. You know, unless the pet you're seeing is at the bottom of the predatory, predatory scale, you know, the stiff upper lip is a preserve purely of the human species. Can they conceptualize their own mortality? Do they despair about the imminent plunge into that deep, dark abyss of infinite nothingness? No, of course they don't. All they know is they're suffering. So when that humane endpoint arrives, aside to the empathetic but firm conversation with an upset and maybe hopeful owner, you know what the animal's best interests are. But it's never that simple. Our clients live in a media-managed world where everything is possible. And insurance helps to make everything possible. And I know that one of the most frustrating parts of your remit uh, is where you can cure a pet, but the money just isn't there to pay for it. With every veterinary show we see on TV, there's never a mention of the associated costs. But still, there's that huma human expectation that it's life at all costs. And that ever so slightly, over the top US example on the uh, left-hand side there, uh, illustrates that uh, rather extremely. And there's a proportion of our client base as well that undoubtedly look to their insurance policies as, as an investment. They expect a return on that investment rather than rejoicing at the end of the year when no claims, claims means that their pet has been fit and healthy for that year. In your world, and this is a generalization, that whole strata of gray hairs, people like me if I didn't diet, have exited the profession a mentoring layer offering guidance and reassurance for the new graduates, for the junior assistants that perhaps in past years has provided a pragmatic perspective that has ensured balance without conscious effort. So your insured clients, they should be cherished, their policies should be respected, they're your gold clients, and helping to keep their premiums palatable and cover robust should be our joint long-term ambition. Without the barrier of cost, they spend twice as much in practice, and they're far more likely to visit you. They can afford the bigger ticket procedures. Look at the index of surgery. 
they have greater engagement with preventive care. And they're around three times more likely in the canine species to merchandise, to buy food. Look at that indices. Let's look at some more dynamics. When we delve a little deeper into the insurance world, uh, we start to see potential storm clouds that will damage both sectors. The pet population is static. Maybe after decades of, of decline in the crossbreed dog population, um, probably from affluence and people wanting a specific breed, or animal charities and neutering everything that crosses across their threshold, you know, we've seen marginal boosts with the design of crossbreeds, labradoodles and, uh, and cockapoos at least. Sadly, and more recently, the popularity of the brachiocephalic breeds. And insurance penetration has virtually flatlined over that same five-year period. Not that insurance haven't continued to sell new policies, they've sold bucket loads, but market attrition virtually nets off the gains. So insurance penetration just creeps forwards. That means there's probably at least another 20% of pet owners who've had insurance, could still be insured, but have had a bad experience. Whether that's cover, or in this day and age, more likely cost, or perhaps both, but they've exited, exited insurance and they will never come back. So in the face of static populations uh, and uh, static pet popu uh, pet pen uh, insurance penetration, premiums have soared. We touched on that. But, uh, Sarah mentioned the RSA uh, uh, studies. Mintel estimate the growth in the market's next work over the next five years will come exclusively from premium inflation, driven in turn by claims inflation, rather than a healthy supporting unit growth in the number of policies. But that's a linear projection. It's not the real world. It's based on what's happened in the past. But where are the funds going to come from to pay for this growth? If it's insurance that's going to be squeezed harder, then that bubble will deflate. It won't pop. It's not going to happen overnight, but it will deflate. Either people will self-insure, prices go up, or policies will become significantly more restrictive. And that will challenge owners' perception of value for money, weighing, weighing up the risk, premium and cover equation. The one certainty is that Mintel's forecast of a 2.1 billion aggressively uh, marketplace in five years will be tempered. The question is by how much and how quickly. Perhaps the biggest threat to animal welfare and quality of life, therefore, and our best care ambition is not working together as two close industries to ensure the current insurance propositions remain sustainable. That the policies we passionately believe in and passionately believe owners, uh, uh, owners and their pets need and the policies that allow you to crack on and do the very best for your patients. Insurance industry only exists because of the development and the sophistication of veterinary science. And the veterinary sector will never achieve its true potential without a buoyant insurance industry. Remove that insurance insulation for the owner and for the profession, and we're back into the quaint old days of Darby 358. Fondly remembered, but perhaps not so yearned for by today's discerning dog and cat owners. In the face of those pets that aren't really that sick, in the face of life at all costs, and with the prospect of more restrictive products and falling penetration, I suggest, set against the huge benefits insurance offers owners, pets and the profession, the biggest impact on animal welfare, the biggest impact on quality of life will come for the demise of insurance. And with this in mind, we have a duty and to strive as two symbiotic <coughs> interwoven industries to ensure it remains as an effective, robust, valued component, providing the very best pet healthcare where appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. We've got a, a range of questions um, oh dear. coming in. I know. <laughs> See how we go. Um, first question, does peace of mind for owners actually always equate to good animal welfare? <sighs> 
I think some owners are probably quite naive. I think some owners see uh, the miracles that happen on TV and they don't quite put it into perspective. I think some owners as well, uh, and it depends who the owner is, whether the pet is part of a family in the second division of emotions, but the pet comes as well, compared to your only companion in life, you have a different perspective. Do you think that a comprehensive insurance policy pressures us to go further than we should, more often than we should, because of financial constraints? I think it enables you to go further. And in some instances, that's absolutely appropriate. And in some instances, as we discussed, it's absolutely not. There's no such thing as a bad insurance policy, and I know you'll all probably disagree with that, as long as the owner knows what they've bought. So, for example, I haven't got a crossbreed cat, I've got two, two horses that are like big dogs, um, hardly ever ridden, but absolutely pampered. I had a prospering cat, I would buy the cheapest insurance policy to get a condition diagnosed and under management, and I'd take future bills where appropriate uh, uh, on myself. If I had perhaps a, a French bulldog or a British bulldog, then I'd probably go out and buy the best policy possible. Um, it, it depends. Should insurance cover homeopathic ther uh, therapies? <laughs> Mess that one up. An interesting one. Given that most preparations won't make it over the level of the excess, it probably doesn't matter that much, but it does, it does, it does send a message out. I think looking at, uh, at our underwriter in the audience, uh, our, our policies won't be uh, from, uh, from, from the middle of this year. Do you think that corporate practices are fueling increased claims by using financial targets for vets? I think, I think our world has undoubtedly changed. And I look at the claims that come in from different corporate groups, and some have always been significantly higher. Some have always thrown the kitchen sink at an insured pet, without a shadow of a doubt. And some, there's more balance there. It's not an exact science, believe it or not, um, but it does bring bigger business mentality into your world. A bigger business mentality means that uh, so many vets now are, are salaried assistants, and they go to work, they don't have a share in their own business, and you know, they are practicing veterinary medicine, often as not to the best of their ability with the resources that they have available. A lot of those corporate practices have a lot of resources available, either within the veterinary hospitals that they work in or within the central referral center. Another question from Greg Dixon. Uh, welfare outcomes between the insured and insured treated patient may be similar. But what about the pet who never makes it to the vet due to cost limitations? Absolutely. And this is my point at the end. If insurance disappears, there's going to be a lot more people okay. who actually don't take their pets to the vet and don't have that treatment because they fear the, uh, the, the likely cost. If you look at the difference in, in, in insured versus uninsured scales from the, 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 the veterinary insights uh, uh, table I put on the table, it's, it's undoubtedly that, 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 that barrier of cost that stops the uninsured owner going to the vet so often. Um, is the need for insurance reducing because more surgeries are offering payment plans? Uh, whether it's a biscuit tin, whether it's a payment plan or whether it's insurance, if you have a pet, you need to make provision for that pet's health. Um, and you've got that bond of trust with your vet that they will guide you through some of the really tough decisions. That's another way of, of, of funding your veterinary fees. You know, when something happens, then look to have a payment plan to borrow the money to fund that. That's not always within people's remits. So, you know, we've had uh, uh, people who work for us who weren't insured, where the £2,000 colic bill, Obviously, it's been paid for, but it's destroyed the household budget for the next two years. So no holidays. The car hasn't replaced. Um, it has some serious impact. So payment plans have their, have their, have their place in the world. Okay. Well, time for just one more, I'm afraid. There are a number of questions coming through, but there's just time for one more. Do you feel insurance companies are failing rabbits and compromising their welfare by only providing £2,000 per year coverage? Um, I think it's probably, probably appropriate to the species and the expectations of the species. 
So, you know, there's always been that guilt factor when little Johnny's come in with a rabbit under one arm, holding hands with the, the parent and the piggy bank under the other arm. And I think rabbits, in a lot of instances, are very much childhood pets. I think owners conceptualise, uh, or the parents and the owners conceptualise that to a certain extent. Um, but uh, I think you can probably do an awful lot with £2,000 for a rabbit. Thank you very much, Simon. A round of applause for Simon again. Thank you.